to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. So, hydrothermal vents was last episode's big deep sea ecosystem, and we said we were going to move on this episode to whale falls. Who are we going to chat to about whale falls? I think we should chat to a guy who was involved in some of the early whale fall. I don't think he could have even been one of the guys who kind of discovered it as a phenomenon. Oh, you know what? Let's just give him a call. So today we have Craig Smith, who is a professor of oceanography at the University of Hawaii and an all-round deep-sea legend, and he has worked all over the world. He's led over 77 research expeditions from the equator to Antarctica, and he's published 240 papers on deep-sea ecology, biodiversity, climate change impacts, marine protected areas, and deep-sea mining. But he's also a pioneer in the field of whale fall ecology, and that's why we're talking to him today. So welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Craig. Thank you, Alan. So, Craig, let's start at the start. What is the journey from the surface to the deep sea that begins at the point of death of a whale? Well, most whales, contrary to popular belief, actually, sink when they die. Most whale species are slightly negatively buoyant Mm -hmm. when they're healthy, and most of them die when they're unhealthy and they're often nutritionally stressed. Many, the baleen whales in particular, are migratory species, and so they live in one one part of the ocean, often at high latitudes, and migrate to low latitudes to spawn and then migrate back to their feeding grounds. And in the migrations, there, there is significant mortality. And most of the whales that die in the ocean end up sinking to the sea floor. And they probably go down pretty rapidly. They, they may start sinking slowly, but then as any of the gas in their body compresses, they sink to the sea floor relatively rapidly. So there's almost certainly very little scavenging on the way down. Mm-hmm. So most whales hit the bottom of the sea floor intact. And most of the deep sea floor is a very food poor environment because most of the food that's available are very small particles of phytoplankton detritus, for example, or carcasses of zooplankton that sink down to the bottom. The smaller particles that sink more slowly and get consumed on the way down. So by the time you get to the deep sea, there's very little food availability. And a whale, in contrast, is a huge, gigantic bonanza of food when it hits the seafloor. So I, I read once about this bloat and float, so that's not a thing. The idea that the, the gas expands and then they float, then they sink a bit and it bursts and then it goes back up and, and so on and so on. That happens if they are kept in shallow water. A number of scientists have done modeling of this and also observations. And if a whale dies and is retained at the surface in a net, for example, or if it mm-hmm. sinks in shallow water, less than 100 meters, then the decompositional gases can float it up, although it doesn't always. We've sunk whales in 30 meters and they didn't come up. Oh, okay. So because the gas becomes compressed as you go deeper for every 10 meters down, it gets reduced by 50% in volume. And also gas is much more soluble in cold water, the decompositional gases than in in warmer water. So you don't have to go very deep before these decompositional gases don't float the whales back to the surface. Hmm. So how did we discover this as a sort of deep sea phenomenon? Is this something that people were saying, clearly, when a whale dies, it must be sinking? Or was this something that was a sort of serendipitous thing where somebody just come across one and then suddenly it's like, well, of course they do this? There wasn't really too much discussion of it. There were some early papers in the 30s that talked about whales sinking to the bottom as potential food for the deep sea. But nobody really thought too much about it until we found a whale skeleton on the bottom of the ocean with a whale fall community in 1987. We were diving with Alvin and were actually trying to do a transect and we kind of went off course. I, I was not in the submersible. I was the chief scientist of the cruise and two graduate students were running the dive for me and they got off course and happened on this huge skeleton of a, apparently a blue whale, 21 meters long. Wow. I mean, they were really excited, but they didn't use the underwater telephone yeah. to call us up and tell us, oh, we found a whale skeleton. What, what should we do? They just <laughs> said, oh, this is so cool. So they just grabbed a random bone and came up to the surface. And this happened to be the last dive of the cruise. Of course. They brought it up. They had some images on the bottom that weren't very high resolution. We could see some, looked like clamshells around it uh, and a bone, which was pretty cool. But we, well, geez, we can't. We can't even write a paper on this because we can't see what kind of animals on it. It might be clams on the sediments around it, but we can't really tell. So that that was quite interesting. That's very frustrating, isn't it? That's the the nature of the business, though, right? You get these, sometimes you get this snapshot of something huge and you're like, oh, not quite there yet. Yeah, that's kind of a recurrent theme in, in whale fall ecology where people found a whale just right at the end of the dive. 
did a little bit of sampling, and then they couldn't find it again. So for a year, we didn't have any real data that we could write a paper about. So we ended up convincing the National Science Foundation to give us a grant to go back to the next year and do some sampling. And then that was the first whale fall paper in, in 1989 in Nature. Nice. So, I mean, these things are huge, right? So just in terms of weight, you're looking at whales from a couple of tons up to 30 tons, maybe even more? The whales are huge. The, the great whale, the nine largest species of whales are 10 tons or more. The minkies are the smallest, and they are adults are 10 to 12 tons. An adult blue whale, the, the largest size of which probably are no longer present in the ocean, but they can get over 100 tons. So when we think about how much organic matter is in a whale, like a, a, a 40-foot gray whale, it's something like 30 to 40 tons is a reasonable mass of, of soft tissue. So when you think about the whale arriving on the seafloor, you've now got, let's say, 30 tons of meat, which is there. And at this point, this is where the whole whale fall phenomena really starts, right? Because, it, again, it's, it's created this focal point for everything in the area to start coming to. And it has several stages. So can you talk us through the different stages of the whale fall? Sure. Well, when a, a typical great whale might be 40 ton in weight, it's mostly very high quality food, organic matter. A lot of it is in blubber in proteins and also in the oily bones. Something like 10% of the oil in a whale's carcass is actually inside the bone. And when it sinks to the sea floor, the whale may cover 50 square meters of the bottom. And in one instant, the equivalent amount of food that's reaching the seafloor from the whale is equivalent to what falls to the seafloor from small particles over a time scale of 100 to up to 2,000 years, depending on where you are in the deep sea. So it's a huge pulse of food in one, one instant. What we found, and this has been documented now in many different parts of the ocean, that when a whale hits the bottom, it goes through a series of successional stages or changes in the community over time. And the first stage that we've documented is what we call the mobile scavenger stage. And this is where large mobile scavengers like sleeper sharks, hagfish, crabs, and amphipods that come in and very voraciously feed on the soft tissue. And they, they, it's just a huge feeding frenzy that may go on for months or even years, depending on how large the carcass is and where it is in the ocean. So then this mobile scavenger stage goes on and it is a frenzy and you just see bits of whale flying coming, being dispersed from the carcass. In fact, you, you see particles all over in the water column around the whale. And they sink to the seafloor. One thing that's pretty interesting is even when these big sharks bite off a piece of blubber on the whale, it sinks to the bottom. Probably, be, yeah, which <laughs> not all the blubber parcels do, but some of them do and many of the big pieces. And these, these scavengers are sloppy feeders. They're just biting and chewing and, you know, it's a frenzy. Well, they must have all sorts of like, environmental cues going on there because you would have, not only do you have this big thing which is leaking oil, you would have noise of all these animals tearing into it and all the hydrodynamic disturbance that they're doing. All these particles are then now emanating down current. You know, this thing must be like a beacon saying, hi, I'm 30 tons worth of food. Come and get me. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there, there, there's some evidence from scavenger studies that they may may use sound waves or waves that propagate through the sediment called stonely waves to detect the presence of a big carcass or a big food fall. And um, also, there clearly, there will be an odor plume. One of the interesting things to speculate about is what are the compounds in that odor plume that may attract them. And there are, during the decomposition of carcasses, there are some compounds that have interesting names like cadaverine and putrescine that are products of microbial degradation. And apparently they're used by scavengers in terrestrial environments like vultures to detect the odor of a decomposing carcass. So they may play a role in, in the deep ocean as well. We, we don't know, but um, you know, speculation that some of these compounds characteristic of rotting flesh may be an attractant. So there's the second stage, that's when all of the bulk of, of the meat and blubber, if you like, is gone, and you're down to more or less a, a skeleton. That's right. We It's been skeletonized, and then we call this an enrichment opportunist stage because the local sediments and the, the, the bones themselves are still very rich in organic matter. The local sediments have been organically enriched from some of the blubber being pushed into the sediment when the whale hit the bottom, or, and also from bits of the whale raining out and covering the surrounding sediments to a few meters. And we called it the enrichment opportunist stage because there are characteristic species that use organic enrichment at the seafloor for feeding and completing their life cycles. And these are certain kinds of polychaete worms, like we call them capitellids in the family capitellidae, and also several different families of polychaete worms that respond to organic enrichment. And what's kind of interesting is that 
the community that surrounds this whale fall in the deep sea looks functionally, and even with same of the same higher taxa, similar to the kinds of communities that occur around sewage outfalls in shallow water. Some of the same families of polychaetes yeah. um, using the same feeding habits, grazing on the, the organic material in the sediment, also bacteria that are growing in this organic rich material. So that's why we call it opportunistic species responding to enrichment. And then stage three is when the whole thing is, is, is looking a bit worse for wear. This is a sulfur-loving stage, and all these stages are overlapping. During the organic enrichment stage, some of the sediments are so organic-rich that aerobic bacteria can't break down some of this soft tissue. So the system goes anoxic. There's not enough oxygen for the bacteria to use it as an electrolyte acceptor to breathe oxygen, essentially, and break down the organic matter. So what happens in this next stage, the sulfur-loving stage, is that in the bones in particular, but also in the nearby sediments, there's so much organic matter that the decomposition of this tissue in the lipids and proteins in the bones and in the sediments goes anaerobic. So we call them sulfate-reducing bacteria. Instead of using oxygen in their metabolism, they use sulfate as an electron acceptor. They're essentially breathing sulfate and to break down the organic matter, and they produce sulfide, which is a, an energy-rich compound that can be used by another suite of bacteria called chemoautotrophic bacteria. They essentially conduct primary production, but they're rather than sunlight being their energy source, it's the energy in these in the sulfides. So during the sulfur-loving stage, we see animals actually that are closely related, even some of the same species that occur at hydrothermal vents. We have tube worms, pescomide clams. These are big white clams that can be 10 to 15 centimeters long that have in their gills, their gills are loaded with bacteria that take the sulfide that's coming out of the whale and picks organic matter. And this, this stage actually has over 100 species of animals. In fact, on one whale character, we found 200 different species of animals living during this sulfophilic stage. So there's also a reef stage after eventually the lipid does get depleted by bacteria in the bones. And then it's just like a rock. The whale skeleton is a, yeah. a, a reef. And then you find they're, they're actually, we've documented that also. You have animals living on the, on the whale bones as a hard substrate and not using yeah. anything characteristic of the, the, the whale itself. So what are the similarities between whale fall communities and vent communities then? Because we were talking to uh, Chuck Fisher on the last episode, and one of the big stories in vents is larval distribution and how does a vent get recolonized. I've read over the years a little bit about stepping stone hypotheses and stuff like that. So do you think whale falls are offering a, a kind of bridge for vent larvae? They do for some species. You know, whale falls and hydrothermal vents have a long list of species, most of which aren't shared. But there are something like 25 to 30 species that that are shared between hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. It's a small percentage of the total fauna, but they do have shared species. And for example, there's one vescomide clam that lives on hydrothermal vents in on the Juan de Fuca Ridge, so that's off the coast of Washington and Oregon. Yep. They live in Baja, California on hydrothermal vents. And then they occur, occur in whale falls in between along the coast of California. And they're genetically the same species. So it seems quite reasonable that this particular species of clam, Eskimoid clam, is actually dispersing between hydrothermal vents on the Juan de Fuca Ridge and the Guaymas Basin by using whale skeletons as stepping stones. Huh, fascinating. With that in mind, has anyone ever tried to estimate how many whale falls there might be or how many are going down per year? And actually, we've been doing the, these for years. We published the first ones in 2003, and with some very reasonable assumptions, we estimated the known population sizes of the nine largest whale species in the global ocean, the great whales. And if you assume that the uh, sulfophilic stage can last about 10 years, it, we estimated that there are over 600,000 whale skeletons in the bottom of the ocean in the sulfophilic stage, given the current population density. So that's almost probably an order of magnitude more than there are hydrothermal vents. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 600,000 is huge. It's a large number. You know, the ocean is a big, big place, but this is a large number. And if, you, if you're interested in how easy it is for whale specialist animals that require whale falls to complete their life cycles to disperse between whale falls, well, if on a global basis, the mean average distance to the next closest whale skeleton is something on the order of 12 kilometers. They're hard to find if you just go drive around on the bottom, but mm. if you can disperse in the currents for a significant amount of time, there's a good chance that some of your larvae may find a whale fall. 
So the next thing I want to talk about, and that is the Aussie Dax. And we can't talk about whale falls without talking about Aussie Dax. Well, Aussie Dax are called bone-eating worms or zombie worms. And these are really bizarre animals. They're worms without a gut, without an anus. They bore into whale bones. They dissolve the, the mineral matrix of the bone with acid. And then they have this green root life structure that grows out into the bone. And then they absorb organic matter, lipids, and proteins and digest that. And they have bacteria that help them to do that inside their bodies. And then the top of it is they look like a little red palm tree that sticks out of the bone to take up oxygen. So they're bone-eating specialists. There are now about 35 species that have been identified, at least with molecular genetics, of this these worms, although the first one was described in 2003. These worms are really bizarre in the way they, they feed. Their life history is really unusual. Aren't the males microscopic? Yeah, they have dwarf males that are tiny. One female may have tens of dwarf males that are attached to her body, providing sperm for fertilization, kind of like ceratioids in the deep sea. Yeah. In terms of studying whale falls, I mean, even with a number like 600,000, relative to somebody driving an ROV or being in a sub, the, the density is still incredibly low. Have you ever actually gone out with the sole purpose of trying to find one, or do you just accept the fact that you go about doing your normal research, and if you find one, it's a bonus? Well, yeah, if you want to study natural whale falls, you have to be lucky. Early on, when we found the first whale fall, well, we published about that, and I, we, I did some, some of these back-of-the-envelope calculations to figure out how many whales, carcasses there should be on the bottom of the ocean. And it turns out in the gray whale range should be about one for every 200 square kilometers. And that's a big area to search. Yeah. So there's a famous story that I heard very early on in my career about the perils of trying to sink a whale fall and the, let's say in inverted commas, the tools you have to hand to aid in the sinking process. I can walk you through the whole process because it is pretty interesting. And there are some unique characteristics of doing it in the U.S. probably <laughs> because of our liberal laws. We've now sunk seven whale carcasses in various parts of the ocean, and everyone is different and unique challenges. It's, it's quite an exercise in logistics. And one of the ones that's pretty interesting that a lot of people may be familiar with is the one in the original Blue Planet series. Hmm. And we sank that in 1998. What happens when you want to sink a whale in the U.S., there's something called the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and they keep track of all the strandings of whales. And we tell them, oh, we're looking for a whale in this part of the ocean. And so when it comes up, they call us. And then we fly to that site, and we found a vessel that we could charter. We loaded a bunch of ballast on it, and we went out and got the whale. And this whale had been floating for 10 to 12 days. It was stuck under a pier. When we got there, we were kind of concerned that it, it might have deteriorated enough that it might start to fall apart. So what we've done for many whales is that we've wrapped them in purse netting. So my graduate student, Amy Baco, and I put on our scuba gear, went in the water and took per se netting and wrapped it around the whale. And if you've ever been near a dead whale, you realize that this is quite a, a smelly process. Rotting whales yes. sink like nothing else I've ever encountered. They have this very pungent, penetrating odor that you can't get out of your clothes if you touch them. So we, we wrapped this, this gray whale carcass in per se netting. In the process, I was diving and I was kicking my fins and I thought I kicked something. I look around and there wasn't anything there. And so I thought I must have kicked my own flipper. So we, we finished wrapping the whale in per se netting. And then we got back on the boat and we towed it out to sea, about 70 miles out to sea. And then we, it was holding together very well. So we said, oh, we'll just take the per se netting off. So we took that off pulled it on board, and there was a six-foot blue shark wrapped inside Ooh. the netting. It was eating on the whale. It was still alive, and it just swam off. That's probably what I kicked. <laughs> but anyway, so then we had this whale. It was quite buoyant, and we had brought 6,000 pounds of, of steel ballast, and we kept adding that to the whale, tied it onto the tail of the whale, kept adding it, and it wouldn't sink. It wasn't enough ballast to sink it. And so then the chief engineer of the boat said, well, I have an idea. And so he went down <laughs> below and came out with his Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol and just blazed away, bam, 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 bam. And that didn't do any good um, because the bullets didn't penetrate very much. So then he said, well, wait a minute, I have something better. So he went down and came up with this big rifle and started, <laughs> <laughs> started shooting at it. And we all stood back, you know, and I have actually pictures of him blazing away at the whale carcass. And this is a technique that can only be used in the U.S. It turns out that probably all the 
crews on U.S. vessels have their own arsenal of, of weapons. I was going to say, because aren't you at the end at a point saying, uh, you know, your enthusiasm for helping out is, is, is commendable, but what the hell? <laughs> like, yeah, what? Sorry, unless you have an awful lot of lead and can add to the ballast, yeah, we, we have to stop this operation. So then what we did is I, I got down in a little boat, a, a inflatable boat, with a flensing knife, and I was poking holes in the whale trying to get into the lungs to, to get the get the yeah. air out of the lungs. And I was literally up to my armpit into the whale with the flensing oh. knife slicing around. And that was quite gross. And all this gas was coming out, but it still wasn't enough. So then we were getting kind of despondent. Oh, the whale isn't going to sink. And then the captain of this vessel had a really good idea. He said, well, look, the, the ballast is pulling the tail of the whale down. So why don't we tow the whale to see if that just pulls the whale down below the surface. So we did that. We started towing, and suddenly the whale disappeared. And so we stopped the vessel, and it was hanging straight down with the ballast. But we still had a ship's cable tied to the, the back of the whale. So we, we pulled the whale up again to try and get the cable off. And we realized that we weren't going to get it off. The carcass came up under the fizzing, and all kinds of foul odor was coming oh. out. So we lowered it down again, and it sank. So the chief engineer said, okay, well, we'll just cut the cable. So he got out a, a blowtorch, <laughs> went to the, the winch where the, the, the cable was coming off. It came off the winch and then it went about 30 feet up through an A-frame and then down to the whale. So he has to stand back, cuts the cable, and it just, just shoots out, you know, just wet, flap, flying back and forth, whap, 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 goes over the A-frame and goes down to the bottom. So it was gone. We sank it. And we were ecstatic. There's so many red flags in terms of safety involved in that story. <laughs> So yeah, like like you mentioned, if anyone doesn't know, there there are some things in our profession which are truly, truly, truly disgusting. <laughs> One is the uh, the smell of rotting whale carcass. It chokes you, right? It just it doesn't leave it doesn't leave you either. And I think the lipid you know fumes are a carrier for these very <laughs> pungent odors that just are penetrating. And we actually had rented wetsuits when we sank this whale and. We did our best to wash the whale. <laughs> did you hand them back to the shop? Well, we had to hand them back, you know, and we we, we didn't tell them to smell the wetsuits, but they, you know, they didn't they didn't say anything, you know. So maybe some future divers had some interesting experiences. To wrap up, then, having a number of decades under your belt in deep sea science, there must be some misconceptions that you've come across repeatedly that just drive you up the wall. With respect to whale falls, there are a couple. One that uh, I've already mentioned is the idea that most whales, when they die, are stranded on the shore. And if you look at the population statistics for gray whales, for example, we know that in a typical year, there may be 100 or 200 dying. And a good year of stranding is 20 gray whales stranding along the Northeast Pacific coast. So they're going somewhere. They're either going into outer space or sinking. The other misconception, which is a more recent one, is this idea that Ossidax completely destroys whale skeletons. Two of the whale, natural whale skeletons that we've studied, we developed a radiometric dating technique. So we can actually take a whale bone and we can tell you how long it's been since it's died. There's one that we visited over a period of 18 years and the, the sulfur loving community on that skeleton didn't look any different after 18 years in it than the day we found it. Surely if the Ossidax are there because they're feeding off the lipid, they're not going to destroy the entire bone. They're just going to survive there until the lipid's gone. No, the lipid stays there. The, the whole Does bone it? is impregnated in lipid. But what happens with Ossidax is that they're great whale bones, the mature great whale, the bones are huge and they're, they're mm. essentially a rock. They're hydroxyapatite, which is a, a mineral that doesn't dissolve in seawater. We found multiple whale skeletons that have evidence of oxidax boring and no living oxidax on them. And we've even found whale bones that are covered with a manganese crust that takes thousands of years to deposit. So we know these bones have been on the bottom for thousands of years. So there's all kinds of evidence now that oxidax die off on, on great whale skeletons before they destroy the bone. That's crazy. They end up with a manganese crust. Yeah. We've actually found bones of extinct beaked whales on the bottom in the, the clarion Clipperton zone. The bones are still there and they have a manganese crust on them. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. And with that, Craig, I think our time's up. I just want to say thank you very much. I thought that was absolutely, totally and utterly fascinating. All righty. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, this is explorer oceanographer Don Walsh, and today's program is called Deaf Whale, Dead Whale. The major source of whale falls is ship strikes that kill about 20,000 whales per year worldwide. And by comparison, commercial whaling takes just 
1,000 animals per year. And the death toll is increasing, with 2022 being the worst year on record. And the culprit is man-made noise pollution in the ocean. Understandably, whales must have outstanding hearing abilities, as some species can communicate over great distances, distances measured in hundreds of miles. With their extreme acoustic sensitivity, it's not surprising that excessive sound in the sea can severely stress or permanently damage their hearing. Often, they cannot hear a ship until it's too late. At the same time, the ship's crews cannot see them. Also, they are poor radar targets, and sightings at night are nearly impossible. This is a big problem for ship operators and government agencies who want to avoid these incidents. But it is not unsolvable. For whales, speed kills. In World War II, merchant ships travel at a stately 8 to 10 knots. Today, some can move at 25 knots or higher on a regular basis. Also, size matters. In World War II, the ubiquitous Liberty ship weighed 8,000 tons. Currently, the largest cargo ship is almost 200,000 tons, equivalent to four World War II battleships. And they are long, with some being over 1,300 feet. That's a bit over a quarter mile. Ship's machinery and propeller noise are the primary sources of damaging acoustic energy radiated into the sea. The largest container ships can have a massive 140 14,000 horsepower engine driving a single 40-ton, 20-foot diameter propeller. Well, why don't whales detect all this noise and simply move out of the way? Well, it's because they are slow swimmers relative to the ship's speeds, and under certain conditions, they simply do not hear the larger vessels. For example, when the ship's bow is pointed at the whale, the sheer mass of the ship and its length mask the machinery and propeller noise. In other situations, the ship's radiated sound is so great that the whales are deafened and become disoriented. Then ship strikes happen. On the larger ships, the crew may not even know they've hit one, as the ship's bridge can be 1,300 feet from the bow. And several years ago, there was a very famous picture of a cargo ship arriving in port with a dead whale draped across its bow. The ship's crew was unaware of it, and in fact, the first time they knew about it was when the pilot guiding them into port told the bridge crew that there was a, actually a whale hung up on the bow of their ship. Well, what can be done? Areas of whale concentrations are somewhat seasonal, so knowing their migration paths and location of breeding grounds can help ship operators avoid the most congested areas with a minimum disruption of their voyage schedules. And scientific agencies can develop predictions of where the animals will be and can provide forecasts to the shipping companies. Research has shown that as ship speeds increased, the whale strikes also increased. Before the 1950s, when transit speeds were much lower, ship collisions with large marine mammals were infrequent. The best chances for reduction of whale mortality is a sweet spot where the ship speed is between 10 and 14 knots in those areas where whale concentrations are expected. Each year, the volume of global marine traffic continues to grow. Bad news for whales. However, with some modification of shipping routes, reduced vessel speeds, and forecasting of areas where ship strikes are likely, both mammals in the sea and those inside the ships can coexist to the benefit of both. It is possible to protect these largest marine mammals who share our planet with us and still maintain the growth of global shipping. Well, that's all for now, and thanks for listening. And that concludes this pressurized version of the Deep Sea Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to go into some more detail, you can find the full episode in the feed. Just match the episode numbers. We'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already. If you would like to advertise with the Deep Sea Podcast, feel free to get in touch. Our audience is primarily young people with an interest in science, often undergraduates or people considering a degree in marine science, but it also includes established scientists. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in reaching these groups.